All right. Welcome everybody to Mormons Building Bridges Online Sunday School. We're super excited today to have James Britton as our teacher. Um, he said that anybody who'd like to share a comment, you can just feel free to unmute yourself and jump right in. Um, otherwise, if you're not talking, please do leave yourself muted. There's a mute button at the bottom left. Um, that way we don't get any feedback from your side of things. Um, just want to let everybody know that we are recording and this will be posted on Mormons Building Bridges um, a little bit later. So with that, um, we'll turn the time over to James. Thanks, Rebecca. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining today. Uh, I'll introduce myself first, and then we should start with a prayer. So I'm going to uh, ask if someone, so think about if you may be touched, moved, and inspired to pray at the beginning or end. Um, today's lesson should be pretty uh, it's not going to take up a full hour. I like short meetings, so um, let's just jump right in. So uh, I am in Arlington, Virginia. I've been a member of the church since I was a boy, uh, born and raised in the church, and I currently attend the Arlington Second Ward in the McLean Stake. Uh, I'm in a committed long-term uh, partnership with my partner, and i um, I, like many of us, have a very unique faith journey and story of where we have been and where we are now and, and where we're going. So um, my approach to my faith and my identity has been very unique, and um, I'm happy to welcome each one of us here where we are at our faith journey and our journey of identity and being a human being. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll give you a second now. Is there anyone who would be willing to volunteer and start off with a prayer? I'll give a few moments to raise your hand if you feel moved. Okay. Rebecca, would you mind offering the prayer? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Dear God, we're so grateful to be able to gather here today for this Sunday school. We pray that we may have thy spirit here to teach us, that we may learn to love better, that we may learn to come near unto thee. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you. And like Rebecca said, I, I have a few PowerPoint slides I tend to organize visually and uh, the best. So I'm gonna share my screen in a moment, but if you, I have several questions, I'm gonna have a stop and either think about or write down. If you'd like to contribute, feel free to unmute yourself and just join in. There's no need to raise hands or uh, you can drop a, a comment in the chat uh, box if you'd like, but feel free to just jump right in and announce who you are. So with that, let me try sharing my screen. Give me a moment. Okay. And Rebecca, you can see my slide here, correct? Yes, I can. Okay, great. All right, so I've entitled this The Hidden Beauties and Promised Blessings of Simplifying Our Lives. And this topic comes from a talk by Elder Uchtdorf in General Conference of October 2010. And the talk is called Of Things That Matter Most. And the driving question in Elder Uchtdorf's talk and our driving question today is what matters most to you? If he's talking about things that matter most, what is it that matters most to us? This made me think of from my old college, college days in psychology class. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is an interesting time in the world because we know that things are in turmoil with the coronavirus and there's a heightened awareness and a heightened need um, above what is usually there of people not having basic needs met. If we look at the bottom of this kind of pyramid of needs, the bottom is uh, physio uh, physiological needs. So this are basic needs of everyone, food, shelter, clothing, the ability to sleep somewhere and be safe. Um, we have heightened awareness, like I said, that some people are without food right now, or they're not able to pay their rent so they can have a safe place to sleep. So, um, of course, this is a basic need. As we work our way up, as people have their basic needs met, then they start looking to have higher needs met, which is safety, personal security, 
employment. That's a big need that people are talking about, losing employment right now. Having resources, having health and health care, having a property, having a place to stay. Once those needs are met, there's a higher level of needs that belong under love and belonging. So having friendships, having intimacy with other people, having family, and a sense of connection to community. Once those needs are met, we have esteem, which is self-respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, and freedom to uh, live every day according to your own self-esteem. And then the very tippy top, once you have all these below, is what Maslow calls self-actualization. So the desire to thrive, to become, to grow, to learn, to prosper. And I thought this quote, when he was describing his hierarchy of needs, this model, it made me think of something that the Savior has said. Uh, Jesus in the New Testament said, uh, man will, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And Maslow said, kind of along these lines, it is quite true that man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. But what happens to man's desires when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? So when we have these basic needs, hopefully uh, all of us here, since we're tuning in to Zoom, probably have an internet connection or a phone or computer. So I'm assuming most of us here have basic needs met. We have a place, a roof over our head. Hopefully we've had something to eat this morning and we have uh, this ability to log on to Sunday school. So when our bellies are full, when we have these basic needs, what is it above and beyond? What is it that man desires when our bellies are chronically filled? Elder Uchtdorf talks a little bit about this in a spiritual sense, so let's jump right in. There are three questions I want us each to think about in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes that we'll uh, talk about. So here are my questions for the lesson. I'll bring these up later. One, what is a lesson that you have learned from Mother Nature or by studying nature or by being out in nature the last six weeks since we've been in this shift as a world? And two, can you list one or two things that really matter a lot to you in life? And three, we all have moments of free time day to day. What is one way that you find yourself filling that free time? So you may have had five minutes before you logged on to this meeting. How did you fill that five minutes? Okay, ponder about those. We'll bring them up in a minute. All right, here's a picture of a tree in some mud. Um, it's interesting because my partner is an arborist, so he heals plants and trees. And many people who are either stuck at home or now working from home are looking out of, of their windows and looking at the the neglect, their tree work and the lawn work that needs to be done. So there's a lot of people who are calling to say, oh, I need tree work done. And they're out planting their own gardens, tending to their flower beds because they have a little bit extra time. Elder Uchtdorf gave this example of looking to nature. And he said, it is remarkable how much we can learn about life by studying nature. During seasons when growing conditions are not ideal, trees slow down their growth and devote their energy to the basic elements necessary for survival. So in my mind, if we were trees, what are the basic things we need to survive if growing conditions get really bad? What I think it is, is, is the, uh, our ability to gather nutrients, to have stability, to remain stable and not fall over, and to strengthen our roots and our branches if we're able to do that. In the life of a tree, that might be the most basic elements needed for our survival, right? He goes on to give a few more analogies. Now, many people love Elder Uchtdorf because he talks about being a pilot and airplanes. He always tells an airplane story. He is a great compassionate teacher as well. He talks about turbulence and speed bumps. For those of us who get on a plane occasionally, turbulence is usually not fun. It's anxiety inducing. It can be terrifying. It can make us sick physically. He says, professional pilots understand that there's an optimum turbulence penetration speed that will minimize the negative effects of turbulence. So his question was, when our plane is, is, dry, is flying through turbulence, what is the pilot supposed to do? He says, most of the time, that would mean reducing your speed. Um, so professional pilots, instead of speeding up and getting through the turbulence, they they minimize their speed and find the optimum speed for that turbulence. 
Elder Uchtdorf says the same principle applies also to speed bumps on a road. So this picture here in your neighborhood, imagine approaching this speed bump in the road. Typically, we do not speed up to go over that speed bump, but we slow down a bit and apply just the brakes at the right amount to get over, but not lose too much speed, right? So as drivers, we've learned that there's a certain amount of pause that we have to take because something may jolt us a little bit. He says, therefore, it is good advice to slow down a little, to steady the course and focus on the essentials when experiencing adverse conditions. I don't know about all of us here, um, but for me and, and our home and our region, there are people going through extra turbulence right now. Friends and family who have lost jobs, people who are worried about uh, keeping their health, keeping their family safe, people who have lost, lost loved ones, people who are struggling to get food, to get small business loans, to get money in the bank to cover the necessities. Elder Uchtdorf says, in these times of turbulence, what is the solution? So this can be physiologically, yes, this can also be spiritually. We see as the world is in turmoil that many people, as the scriptures say, men's hearts fail, fail, can fail them. We're worried, we're anxious. There's an increased edge on some of our interactions with our governments, with our family members, with the media, with the day-to-day -day activities of our lives. Elder Uchtdorf says, in times of trouble like this, when there's adversity that's increased, what is the solution? He says, we need to focus on the things that matter the most. He says, we complicate our lives by flooding the open spaces in our time. And he says, this is my paraphrasing, the search for the best things. So what, what are the best things in life that matter most? In our search for the best things, this inevitably leads us to the foundational principles of Jesus, the simple and beautiful truths revealed to us by Heavenly Father. There is a beauty and a clarity that comes from simplicity. So generally speaking, this may not be a time of clarity for many people. This is a time of increased agitation and adversity. And as we search for the things that matter most, we can be pointed in the direction of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the teachings that bring clarity and simplicity. All right, so I have three questions here I'm gonna read out loud. Let me, let me get back to, I'm not gonna share my screen for this one. Let's, okay, I see the grid. So I see a few faces and I know a few people are listening to us. So I'm gonna read these three questions and give you a moment to think. And then if you want to share, I'd love to hear it. Okay, question one. What is a lesson that you have learned from Mother Nature or by being out in or studying nature specifically these last six weeks? So many of us may not be traveling to work, but we're walking the neighborhood more. Is there any lessons from Mother Nature that have come, brought clarity to your minds the last month and a half or two months? I'll give you a moment to think. I know... When we ask a question, sometimes we want to fill the time right now. So it's okay. Just take a moment. If you want to share, jump on in. I've noticed in general, just looking up at the sky and the trees, how much less of a hurry nature is compared to how I usually live my life, just rushing from thing to thing to thing. Um, and just how beautiful that is, just to see the the beauty of calm and yeah. the beauty of of just I don't know, just stopping and and looking at something and really really looking at it, not just rushing past it. Thanks. I've had the same experience. Um, there is, it's been unusually cold this winter. Uh, well. Let me take that back. This winter was kind of mild and rainy, and the spring has been rainy and really cold. And being from Arizona, that's not, I don't love the cold. I just love the sunny weather. So I'm struggling here in Virginia. It's starting to warm up a little bit, but um, once it's warmed up, some mornings I go, there's a, a church across the street from our ward building that has this beautiful outdoor chapel. And I've been going hiking up to the outdoor chapel and just looking up 
So I was sharing this with one of my coworkers and she said, oh, this is kind of a look up moment. Like you look up and, and what do you see? And I, um, I look up at the trees and all I hear are the birds. And like, I, there's this sense of quiet that I, I was never taking time to do this because during that time in the morning, I have to be driving to work. Um, so now I'm taking time to like go and just look up at the trees. And my mantra in this little outdoor chapel has become, instead of, you know, I think internally our monologue is, oh, I'm, I'm worried about work and I have the deadline and, oh, I'm so frustrated with this or that. That may be our daily mantra, I know it is for me, um, but my mantra has become, when I'm looking up, I say, this day was made for beauty and light and not for worry and not for fear, but for creation and for service and for hard work. That's something that has been kind of keenly brought to my attention, despite the calamities that are happening as we watch the TV. So Mother Nature has a way of teaching us if we stop and hear, hear them, hear her, hear him. Mes message from General Conference was to hear him, hear the Savior, hear, hear God, hear Mother Nature as well. We have to take time to listen. Um, question number two. What are one, now this, this is maybe a rhetorical question, unless you have something to, it just comes to mind. What are one or two things that really matter most in life? I know for me, I wrote down three things, my relationship with God and my, my spirituality and connection to the earth around me, uh, my family relationships, and then being able to teach and help others. That's kind of my, my mission with work. Like I, I, I'm a teacher, I try and help others. So Elder Uchtdorf asked us to examine what are the things that are most important to you. So I would invite each of you, if you have paper and pencil near you, to write down two or three things that are actually really important to you. Okay, last question. Can you think of an example of how you flood, he's, Elder Uchtdorf says, we flood our time with something to fill the empty spaces. So what's something that you flood your empty time, the five minutes you have, how do you fill that time? It could be a, a positive connotation. It can also be a negative connotation. We kind of flood, try and drown out the noise of the world. Take the phone and start scrolling. It's, it's, a, it's like a reaction. We don't even think about it now. Okay, let me go back to my screen here. So those are our three driving questions. Okay. Elder Uchtdorf says, as we think about these questions, he says, doing diligently the things that matter most will lead us to the Savior. So if we write down what matters most, we can start seeing how those things, we can walk hand in hand with those things towards the Savior. And what he teaches. And I love this. This is where I really want to focus. This was the, the magic moment of Elder Uchtdorf's talk. He said, as we turn to our Heavenly Father and we seek his wisdom regarding the things that matter most, we learn over and over again the importance of four key relationships. First is our relationship with God. Our relationship with our family is second. Our relationship with our fellow human beings and our relationship with ourselves. Okay. So my fourth question is, Elder Uchtdorf and in turn, Jesus is teaching us to focus on these four key relationships with God, with our fellow human beings, uh, with our family and with ourselves. So my question is, I'd love to have a discussion do any scripture verses or scripture stories come to mind where Jesus showed or taught us to develop these four categories? And I'll give a moment to think. Again, the question is, do any scripture verses or scripture stories come to mind when Elder Uchtdorf and the Savior is teaching us that we need to develop a relationship with God? develop a relationship with our families, with other human beings, or with ourselves. Okay. 
Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, Go ahead. This is Wayne. Um, w one thought that came to mind for me is just the two greatest, you know, when they talk about the two greatest commandments, love the Lord thy God, and talks about what that should look like, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. And so you've got, you know, your relationship with God, your relationship with others, and then your relationship with yourself. And I'll lump family into the other category for now. But that one came to mind when you, were, when you asked your question. That popped into my head. Thanks. Thank you. For me, a scripture that came to mind was, it's kind of a, uh, on the other hand type of scripture. When um, Jesus was in, in the New Testament, there were uh, the scribes and Pharisees were criticizing him because um, they they were focusing on people have to wash their hands before eating, you know it, it's in the it's one of the laws, and Jesus his response was it's not that which goes into the the mouth that defiles a man but it's that which comes out of their mouth that that can defile. And it made me think that Jesus is teaching that which exudes from us can either be tainted or defiling. And on the other hand, that can also be what is pure and good and, and true coming out of us, right? And it made me think that our building relationships with others, our families and our fellow man, that's really done by our communication and spending time. So what's coming out of our mouth and how we What's coming out of us, really? And in my own way of paraphrasing, the Savior is saying it's, it's what comes out of us that makes who we are and, and can cover these four areas. Um, there's a, a couple quotes that Elder Uchtdorf talks about in each of these avenues. So first, um, we improve our relationship with Heavenly Father by learning of Him, by communing with Him, uh, by repenting of our sins. Um, when I hear the word repent, I always think of, of trying things a different way and changing the way we do things. We make mistakes. We do things that may be shameful to us or hurt ourselves or hurt other people. Repenting is turning around and trying a different direction. He says, to strengthen our relationship with God, we need some meaningful alone time with him. So again, Elder Uchtdorf's admonition to go out into nature and to listen and to learn from nature, I think is a really beautiful way. He says, our, our second key relationship is with our families. In family relationships, love is really spelled T-I-M-E, time. Taking time for each other is the key for harmony at home. I think about this, expanding this, not only, of course, to our home relationships, our immediate family, our spouses, our partners, our children, and those we take care of, um, but can we extend this to our interactions, whether they be with our coworkers, our ward members, our neighbors, or our extended sphere of influence through social media, those we interact with. Interactions can get kind of testy at times when we're, you know, Especially with the heightened sense, again, we're in this place in a, in a society, as our society in the world of turmoil and, and, and politics and, and fighting and, and this is what we should be doing and, and there's some heightened conflict. Elder Uchtdorf says we take time to, to talk with each other rather than talk about each other. So do we have the ability to, to talk with so with implies that we're having a conversation, listening and sharing, rather than talking about or talking down to other people. That's what I'm drawing from this, it's really valuable. Uh, building relationship with fellow man. We build this relationship one person at a time by being sensitive to the needs of others, by serving them, uh, giving of our time and talents. I was deeply impressed by one sister who was burdened with the challenges of age and illness, but she decided that although she couldn't do much, she could listen to others. Think about my, my grandmother who was bedbound for many years. She had an incredible talent. All she could really do is, is listen to others and share from her bed. And that was a tremendous service. So I thought 
if we are feeling down in the dumps and just feeling horrible, we can still go out and listen. Listening is a great way to show love to our fellow man. We know there's a great need for that in our world. The last point I thought was really important and really interesting. Elder Uchtdorf teaches us the fourth key relationship to develop is a relationship with ourselves. It may seem odd to think about having a relationship with ourselves, but we do. Some people cannot get along with themselves. They criticize and they belittle themselves all day long until they begin to hate themselves. May I suggest you reduce the rush and take a little extra time to get to know yourself better. Um, so this last point is pretty personal. Um, I'll speak for myself, um, not only as a, a person who identifies as gay and a Latter-day Saint, but just as a, a son of God and, and a, a son and a, a partner and a coworker, like as a human being, um, I have been, and none of us, I imagine, are immune to this. Why, I, none of us are immune to having times where we're critical of ourselves, having times where we realize we don't like ourselves or there's things about us that we hate, um, the way we can internally talk down to ourselves. And it's, it's powerful for me to hear an apostle of the Lord to say, we need to know ourselves and learn to love ourselves. How is that done? For each of us, it's very different. I know for me, uh, unique to my journey in understanding my faith and my, my sexual identity, that included a lot of counseling, a lot of personal work, a lot of pain, a lot of reaching out, a lot of falling down, sometimes feeling like I was pushed down. To be able to seek truth to seek truth from the best books, to, to go to God in prayer. I mean, that's one, one thing, and I know we're all different in our testimony. It's one thing I've always really believed and known that, that the Lord hears my prayers, and I understand that each of us may have different experiences with that. So seeking truth, wherever that comes from, whether that be from going to the forest, going to the scriptures, going to the Lord in prayer, or going to a trusted family member or friend or a counselor, to seek truth. Truth, gems of truth are everywhere. And um, what I see Elder Uchtdorf saying is that if we don't have the ability to love ourselves, that's ultimately going to impede ourselves in having a relationship with other people around us and a, and a relationship with the Lord. I found in my life that that is true. That rings true to me. So um, that's kind of the end of the slides. Is there anything that anyone wants to share overall lesson or with this last point in how or the importance of developing that relationship, that self-worth, and how it might impact our relationship with God and other people. I'll give you a moment to think. Uh, it's me again. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, what, what's interesting, and, and even as you said that, where you were you you ordered them, you know, God, others, family, and then yourself. And that order kind of sent me back just a little bit, mm. only because I have found that I need to work on myself in some ways first. That yeah. once I develop that relationship and as I've grown to accept and love myself, my ability to love and accept others has grown. My ability to truly be present. And I think the biggest challenge for me in this path was, you know, finding that balance between being selfish, but yet, but not, but, you know, being about myself, but not selfish, because that's so, you know, we grew up in, oh, don't be selfish, you need to lose yourself to find yourself, you know, all of that talk, and realizing, though, that I, I can, I can work on, on me, and that's okay, it, it, that's nothing wrong with that. Um, and in some cases, that has to come first, because if it doesn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't be all the other things that I need to be. I just didn't have it to give. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That resonates with me, too. You know, that was the order that Elder Uchtdorf gave, and that it's, a very, um, it's a very ideal way to think, but uh, that resonates with me as well. There's been times in life where I was so low that I, I 
couldn't be available for anything else, for other people, for work, for my family members. I was so detached. Um, and I had to, you know, first be able to stand up on my own and take a step forward. So that really resonates with me too. Um, I think about um, like times where I, you know, this whole thing of there, there is a little bit of a, a balance because I was raised to, I think all of us were, you know, don't be selfish, lose yourself in the service of others. So there's that uh, ideal, which is a truth in and of itself. But sometimes we have to focus on ourselves. If, if those basic needs, like the very first slide we talked about, our, our ability to feel safe, our ability to have a roof over our head or be in a stable place has to come first before we can, um, you know, for example, kind of serving in a, a job, have, holding a job. If you, if you don't have stability in, in and of yourself, you can't hold a job. There, there's a, an order of things. And that makes me think of where uh, the Savior teaches us in multiple scriptures, do not, do not run faster than you are able. You know, pace yourself so you can win the prize. Thank you for sharing that. I, I will say, uh, as we wrap up, I'm just, I think about the phases that um, many of us have gone through over the last decades, 10 years, five years. Whenever we join this journey, I, I, here I see on the screen the Mormons building bridges. And I, I remember back to, I think it was 2012 or 2011 when Mormons Building Bridges kind of came to the forefront and started marching in these parades. And then that spread from Utah. And we had our first contingency in Washington, D.C. And, you know, and then San Francisco and New York City. And I remember how tremendously moved I was in 2012, I think it was, when I saw Latter-day Saints standing up for me, because I was really struggling at that time. We all struggle. That, that's part of life, right? <laughs> Gay or straight, or wh whoever we are, we have some sort of struggle. I was so tremendously moved, like, like my life shifted. That's how moved I was, like my life was shifted. Um, so the people who, uh, you know, some of us are here kind of from the beginning. So you, all of us providing community is, is a holy and a sacred work. So I, I'm very grateful for this. And as time goes on, we think about uh, in 2015 when the, um, the policy change came out and that was like a big shift because we're like, we thought that the church was maybe moving in a more accepting direction and, and they came out with the website and it, there's been kind of steps forward and steps by. So we, we all have this struggle, right? Some of us can share this struggle with our faith community, our wards or our families, our marriages. Some of us can't. We don't feel we're not in a place where there's health and there's safety there. So this community that we have, I don't know, I feel like with the coronavirus and we're, there's a sense of us having to be isolated again, it's easier for us to reach out. Like I haven't connected with Mormons Building Bridges Online or like my online community until now. Um, so it just brings to me the power of, you all are very powerful people. And ultimately what we're doing is saving lives of people who are in our faith community and who need us, who need to be able to see us in some form. And that life-saving work is precious and it is, uh, it's holy. So we all have a part to play and we're part of our faith community, whether or not we're in the church or out of the church, by essence of our association, we're part of this community. So. Thank you for being part of the community. And that's all I got to say. So I'm <laughs> uh, going to ask for someone to say the prayer. I'll give you a moment to think about it. If not, I'll, I'll uh, call on someone. Anyone who feels moved to pray, I'll give you a moment. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll go ahead and close this with a prayer and we'll sign off. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sunday to be with beautiful people connected from our homes and for the, the truths that you have given to us for, for your love, for our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the gospel. 
and for the beautiful paths uh, that we have been led to, that we've taken wherever that leads. Please strengthen all of us, our families and youth in the church, those who are struggling. And we, we acknowledge and we pray for all those on the earth who are without food, who are without means, who are in places of turmoil. Please lift them up and help us that we can be part of, of the solution. We can have open hearts to love and communicate with others as we know we should. Thank you so much for this time. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. That was, that was meaningful to me personally, I'm sure, to everybody. Yeah, well, thanks for hosting it. Good to see you all. See you later. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.